7, Miami. The compass at all times points north. It's free-swinging needle guided by magnetic force. For the compass is a direction finder. It's perhaps for the lack of diplomatic direction that U.S. foreign policy has failed to compass Latin America. But now there are signs that international politics may swing the magnetic pendulum to compass point south. I'm Wayne Ferris. My guest is Florida's United States Senator George Smathers, who recently returned from a three-week trip around Latin America. With him in the boiling Caribbean was WCKT newsman Dick Lobo, whose films you're about to see. Compass Point South is a WCKT news exploration of neighbors at our back door, frustrated economically and politically, pulsating with nationalistic fever fired by communist ideology bound morally to the Catholic Church. This in itself presents a psychological conflict. The Soviets and the Red Chinese have been quick to play upon the emotions of these materialistic starved people. The result? Misguided attacks on the United States. Lack of economic progress in Latin America is the key. For this purpose, the United States has contributed billions of dollars to Europe, Africa, and Asia. For the Latins, we have expounded freedom. They want both. But if it boils down to a choice between freedom and food, the stomach will be heard. And it's a rumble we can ill afford to ignore. The Latins also are class conscious. They're sensitive to the apparent inability of our diplomats and businessmen in Latin America to bridge a cultural gulf. Somehow, the Latins' economic and educational deficiency has emerged as his Yankee neighbor's responsibility unfulfilled. By accepting the challenge of bringing the true Latin image into focus, the United States can still score with constructive thought of action. Armed with this purpose, Senator Smathers, as chairman of a Latin trade subcommittee, staged a fact-finding expedition in the turbulent Caribbean. In Panama, the United States is confronted by both nationalistic and communist elements attempting to shake American control of the Canal Zone. Last November, two anti-U.S. outbursts exploded with political force. The U.S. flag was desecrated and Uncle Sam burned in effigy. It appeared to be the result of a $100 million propaganda campaign the communists have launched in the Caribbean and Central America. Most of Panama's troubles are economic, and it's here Panamanian U.S. relations have deteriorated. Panamanians object to being paid less than their American counterparts in the Canal Zone, and they feel that control of the Canal Zone, now in the hands of three U.S. agencies, should rest with the U.S. State Department. Actually, equal pay for Panamanians and Americans with equal qualifications exists. The real trouble lies in the classification of Panamanians in sensitive jobs. Senator Smathers met with Panama's president, Ernesto de la Guardia, an economist and leader of one million Panamanians. The president quickly got to the heart of his troubles, the $15 million budget deficit, one out of every five Panamanians out of a job. It's easy for these emotional people to build their hopes for the future on control of the canal zone. They have been, there have been past efforts to internationalize the canal, some originating in this country. But the National Security Council and our Joint Chiefs of Staff warned that tampering with our complete control of the strategic canal cannot be tolerated. Flying of the U.S. flag over the canal is symbolic of this control. The Panamanians prefer their own colors. Senator Smathers, do you feel that the flag problem has been magnified? Very much so. Wayne, I think that your analysis of the problem in Panama is accurate. Actually, it's, uh, the flag is just a symbol of the general unrest that's, which the Panamanians feel, not only because uh, of the little differences that we're having over the treaty which we signed with Panama back in 1903, and then, of course, we have updated it from time to time, but primarily because uh, we've cut down the number of people that we have in the Panama Canal Zone so that a lot of the money which used to spill over into the 
Panamanian territory and which provided employment for the people, they no longer have that. Mm -hmm. And there's general in unemployment, there's general dissatisfaction, and what happens is that the communists have moved into this particular picture and are directing uh, the criticism uh, against us. Now, actually, it should not be directed against us. In my own judgment, I cannot help but feel that much of this problem has to be solved and can be solved by intelligent action on the part of the local Panamanian government by supplying uh, agricultural programs, economic programs, and things of that character. Well, Senator, is international communism a threat to Panama, or for that matter, any part of Latin America? Well, international communism is very much on, uh, on the job in Panama, particularly because there, there the people are dissatisfied, uh, there the economic conditions are not good, and it's into that kind of a situation that the communists always move. So they're very much on the job there. An attempted invasion of Panama in 1959 is believed to have had its origin with the Cuban government of Fidel Castro. Some feel it was as much designed to take over the canal as it was to embarrass the United States into committing troops, thereby supporting red charges of American imperialism. One year ago, Cuba's six and a half million population roared its welcome to the forces of Fidel Castro. They spilled out of the mountains to bury dictator Florencio Batista. His superior troops had faded in the wake of public opinion. Castro had not won a major victory. Nonetheless, the Cuban people had their messiah and bountiful promises for the future. Today, Cuba's economy is faltering. Her reform program of reduced rents, lower telephone rates, and gifts of land is designed to appeal to the working people and the peasants. But the reforms have been proven costly. Construction is now at a standstill. Incentive investments go begging. And Castro's tirades against the United States knifed into Cuba's tourist trade. Nearly a billion dollars in U.S. investments are threatened with nationalization. Bankruptcies are on the rise. It all adds up to state ownership. Castro denied this is communism. He says Cuba is going the way of Afro-Asian neutralism. But the Soviet Union is talking of basing nuclear rocket launchers in Cuba, and Castro is reported harboring a demand that the United States get out of Guantanamo. To do so would open a dangerous loophole in our defense system. Nevertheless, President Eisenhower has promised no reprisals. This is what the experts refer to as U.S. patience, or the turning of the other cheek. In some respects, Castro's vitriolic attacks on the United States have backfired. Other Latin nations view us in a more sympathetic role. Even the visit to Cuba by the Soviet Union's number two man, Anastas Mikoyan, may have served as a deterrent to the spread of communism. Mikoyan's talks with Castro have awakened the Latin populace to the danger of a major communist foothold in their midst. The United States, meanwhile, is attempting to ease U.S.-Cuba tensions. The Immigration Department is trying to enforce a ban on residents of militant anti-Castro forces in Florida and along the Gulf Coast. Our 1960 sugar purchases from Cuba increased but her future quarter will be determined by the Senate Finance Committee, of which Senator Smathers is a member. Growing rebel activity is reported in Cuba. The Catholic Church has recoiled against the communist menace. There's fear Castro will issue sanctions against the church. Batista-like police state methods again prevail in Cuba, where neighbor spies upon neighbor, where trials are conducted by military tribunals, where a cautious man is a counter-revolutionary, and where the words free elections echo in their grave. This is the bearded New Deal Castro gave Cuba in 1959. It may well have sown the seed for another bloody insurrection. Senator Smathers, is Castro a communist? Well, Wayne, I don't know whether he's a communist. I would personally doubt that he, as an individual, is a communist. I don't believe he carries a card or anything of that character. But I think the answer is that his government is following a course which is similar to that followed by every communist dictatorship. And there is no doubt of the fact that he has surrounded himself in his government with well-known communists. Senator, would you recommend a cut in the uh, sugar quota? I don't believe that we should uh, let ourselves be pictured as engaging in reprisals. On the other hand, I think we have every right. As a matter of fact, I think we should insist that as long as Cuba is going to make a trade agreement with the Soviet Union and be willing to sell them sugar, 
at two to three cents a pound, I can see no reason why we as sensible people should continue to pay five and six cents a pound for that same sugar. I believe that in point of fact, as a matter of fairness, we should say to Mr. Castro and this government that we're no longer going to pay this premium price for the sugar as we have been doing. Mm -hmm. Would you attach any significance to the castro Miguyan meeting? Very much. I think it was indicative of their closer active open association with the Soviet Union, and particularly do I attach significance to the fact that uh, it was agreed by Mikoyan to sell to Cuba's, uh, Castro's Cuba, uh, the arms and munitions which he seeks so much. Well, the bitterest rivalry in the Caribbean exists between Cuba and the Dominican Republic, a territory about the size of New Hampshire and Vermont together, her population two and three quarter million. For 30 years, the Dominican Republic has been ruled by Generalissimo Rafael Trujillo. He's given his people an extensive highway system, improved health conditions, boosted the country's agricultural economy, and made education compulsory. But Trujillo rule has been that of a closed corporation based on family ties. It has resulted in a curious combination of modern efficiency, lots of buildings in a centuries-old setting, and little freedom. Trujillo has been subjected to unrest, created by invasion noises by Castro, discord with Venezuela, reported revolt by the tiny republic's better families, and an organization of American states' denunciation that Trujillo's government is in violation of human rights. Senator Smathers and newsman Lobo talked with the Dominican leader in Ciudad Trujillo. The dictator acknowledged internal conspiracies against his government, but denied their widespread and rejected charges of misrule. Trujillo admitted 126 persons had been arrested, but insisted that all received fair trials. The arrests, however, provoked the Catholic Church into a bold demand for liberties for all people of the Dominican Republic. And Trujillo has responded with the promise of free two-party elections. Here now is WCKT newsman Dick Lobo's exclusive film interview with strongman Rafael Trujillo. Do you feel that the reports that you've been reading are fair? Uh, what do you feel should be done about the Cuban situation? It's a good thing that should be done in relation to the situation of Cuba. I don't want to talk about the situation of Cuba, because I don't want to talk about Cuba, because I don't want to talk about Cuba in any country. The situation is that he doesn't want to talk about the Cuban situation, because he doesn't want to uh, get involved in any uh, foreign country uh, uh, situation. Hay que respetar el principio de no intervención. Uh, we should be respected the principle of no intervention. How many people in actuality were arrested last week? Uh, actualmente, ¿cuál fue el número exacto de las personas que fueron arrestadas la semana pasada? 126. 126, very well. Now, there have been reports and rumors that there are torture chambers and that the prisoners have been grossly mistreated. Is there any truth in that? Es decir, que ha circulado los rumores de que hay cámaras de tortura y que los prisioneros han sido muy mal tratados. Los que se han estado yendo todos los días al Palacio de Justicia no están siendo juzgados y sus familiares van a verlos. Es decir, que se ha dicho que los prisioneros han sido tomados al Palacio de Justicia, al Palacio de Justicia, y todos los familiares han ido a verlos y todos los que pueden ir a verlos, así que no se pueden ir a verlos, así que no se pueden ir a verlos. Do you think that the plots that have been formed against you are communist-inspired or Cuban-inspired? Dice que si usted considera que los complots, ese que había, había existido aquí para asesinarlo, era inspirado por el movimiento cubano o por un movimiento comunista. Dicen que es inspirado por el movimiento, movimiento comunista que es en el área del Caribe. The Socialists say that there is, it's, it's been stated that this uh, situation has been created by this communist uh, movement that has uh, been going on with the Caribbean area. Senator, do you feel that Trujillo intends to carry out a program of free elections? Well, Wayne, I don't really know. The only thing that I know is what Trujillo told me, which was that he would have city elections within 15 months and that he would have nationwide elections within two years. I endeavored to convince him that it was important to him as well as to the United States, that we make some transition from his government of dictatorship into a democracy, because if there began a fight for power 
whether he was thrown out or whether he died. Uh, then, of course, I was greatly worried that we'd have another situation like we have in Cuba, where the communists, who are well-disciplined, well-trained, waiting for him to fall, they will move into the vacuum which would result by virtue of his vacation of his position and then we would find, the United States would find that not only had Cuba fallen into the hands of the communist uh, international conspiracy, but also the Dominican Republic. And that's what worried me. That's why I went to him and tried to get him to sort of move over. But why are you so certain that Trujillo will uh, not become a victim of a revolution? Well, I'm not so certain that he won't. But I must say this, that our own military people down there who are rather knowledgeable about how strong a man is with his own government, uh, our own embassy people, as well as the American businessman who's operating there, they were all of the opinion that Trujillo's army is so strong that uh, it's not going to be able to be, he's not going to be able to be invaded from outside. As a matter of fact, you recall, I think it was last August when Castro sent 300 men against of the Dominican Republic, and uh, they were quickly obliterated. Mm -hmm. Now, he spent a lot of money building up a very excellent army, so it's not logical to believe that somebody's going to take him easily. Mm -hmm. And I think the easiest way to get the man out, and at the same time to turn this government back into the hands of Dominicans where they can run their own democracy, is to impress upon him that the only possible way he can ever have his name go down into history appreciated by his own people is to have him give them democracy so they can say this man not only has given us economic development, which he has, but he's also given us democracy. Then he has a chance of having his name survive, but more important to us, we have a, the absolute certainty then that the government will not find its way into the hands of the communists. But by continuing to deal with dictators, is the uh, United States not reducing our prestige with uh, other countries? When the President of the United States is just about to make a visit to the Soviet Union, when nine governors of the United States can go and visit in Moscow, when some 22 senators can go and visit with the greatest conspiracy and dictatorship that there is in the world, a cruel and heartless dictatorship which has pledged to the destruction of democracy and religion and everything that we hold dear and not be criticized. I don't understand how people can justifiably criticize anybody for visiting a little dictator, cruel as it is, but at least a dictator who has in the past cooperated with the United States, who today cooperates in that he puts we have our big guided missile observation tower on his land. He has two letters from Franklin Roosevelt thanking him for cooperation, uh, his cooperation during the war. I don't believe that uh, we, we hurt ourselves uh, greatly uh, because I don't believe that good people can draw a double standard, say that it's all right to go visit a communist dictatorship, but it's not all right to go visit uh, a little fellow like Trujillo. Who's tough? Who's a dictator whom I hope eventually we will get rid of. In Venezuela, one of the least densely populated countries in Latin America, democracy is suffering birth pains. In May 1958, our relations with Venezuela took a downward turn. Vice President Nixon, on a goodwill tour of the Americas, was spat upon and stoned in Caracas. The government blamed the communists. In Venezuela, the Reds thrive on a shaky economy. At the root of the trouble were U.S. oil royalties siphoned off by the Jimenez administration. The present government of President Romulo Betancourt has renegotiated the oil leases with 60% of the net profits going to the government. Yet since taking office less than a year ago, Betancourt has been the target of five coups. Senator Smathers has noted that Betancourt has less stability than any other chief of state in the Americas, but that with every day he remains in power, Venezuela moves deeper into the democratic orbit. This is no simple matter. Betancourt, in order to retain office, has fathered a coalition government, including leftists. Thus, his recent warning against Venezuela foolishly taking the path of Cuba in its hostility toward the United States has the red element clucking. Betancourt has broken with Fidel Castro, but this has not deterred his efforts to rattle the Dominican Republic's Trujillo. Senator, Venezuela has lodged such charges now as violation of human rights against the uh, Dominican Republic before the Organization of American States. What action can the OAS take? Well, the OAS, uh, under its charter, could uh, send a commission 
or set up a commission to study whether or not uh, that government is violating uh, human rights. Mm -hmm. I think that it is well within the authority of the Organization of American States to do that. And for my own part, I, it wouldn't bother me at all. In fact, I think it probably would be a good idea. But I would also say that if they decided that they were going to look at the violation of human rights in the Dominican Republic, they should also look at the violation of human rights in Cuba. Again, I don't think that we should continue, as, as unfortunately we see happen, to draw a distinction between dictatorships, to say that a dictatorship of the left is all right, but a dictatorship of the right is not all right. I think that we should classify them all alike and keep them all alike. And that's my only uh, disagreement with the recommendation of Venezuela. I think it's fine, but let's apply it to all dictators alike, not just to one. Well, without a military arm, where can the OAS acquire its strength? Well, the OAS ha also has the authority to make an appeal uh, under Section 64 of the Charter to the other countries in the OAS, which is the United States, Canada, Mexico, and so on, mm -hmm. and ask each one of these countries to make a contribution of arms in order to carry out its policies. Actually, that's what they did, you recall, when Panama was invaded earlier last uh, summer, and they then called upon other nations uh, in the area to help them, and, and they all fortunately responded. Bordering the Dominican Republic and occupying the western third of the island of Hispaniola is Latin America's only French-speaking nation, Haiti. Geographically, this Negro Republic is a strategic pawn in the worsening relations between the Dominicans and Cuba. Since 1957, this primitive country has been ruled by Francois Duvalier. His policies are respected, if not popular. Duvalier's problem is to feed an illiterate population of four million while fighting communist infiltration. The United States has provided Haiti with technical and point four program aid. Senator Smathers proposes even more economic and military aid for the Haitians, whose army of 5,000 is being trained by an American military mission. Our biggest concern is how much aid we should give before demanding a Haitian democracy in return. Only 45 miles west of the Dominican Republic, is the most European of the Latin nations, the United States Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. This island territory is 95 miles long and 35 miles wide. Her population, two and a quarter million. Her governor, Luis Munoz Marin, has been the strongest influence on Venezuela's Betancourt to abandon the communist cause. Marine is satisfied with Puerto Rico's Commonwealth status, but oppositionists are demanding everything from statehood to independence. Puerto Rico, once the poorest country in the world, today enjoys the highest per capita income of any Latin nation. Marine brought this about through Operation Bootstrap. He reorganized and recognized the need to translate some of the island's growing tourist wealth to the income of the natives. As a result, Puerto Rico has been enjoying the benefits of statehood without the disadvantages of federal taxes. Senator Smathers, did you find uh, evidence of major communist organization operating uh, in this particular area on that island? Well, Wayne, I didn't find uh, any, but uh, I continue to hear reports that there are a number, a lot of communists, and that there is considerable communist activity. However, I, I'm, I, I agree with what you've just now concluded saying, that Munoz Marine has done a very excellent job of elevating the economic conditions of that country, and at the same time, they have a great measure of political freedom. The combination of that, of course, uh, can do more to stop communism than any other thing that I know of, and that's what he's done. And I think he deserves a great measure of credit for the fine job which he's done. One well, of the biggest questions, I guess, is what you recommend that the United States do to improve our relations with Latin America. So Wayne, I'm going to make a rather detailed speech on the floor of the Senate next Tuesday and, and list some 25 major things that I think we ought to do. But to, to sum it up very briefly, if I had to pick just one, I think that once again it's a matter of exchange programs. Student exchange programs are the best. Where the people down there, young people, uh, learn uh, actually what the people of the United States believe, how they are, uh, what type of government they actually live under, and at the same time, we in turn learn more about them. I think that if we can learn about each other, we can solve most problems which exist. Senator Smathers, do you favor the appointment of an Under Secretary of State 
for the Western Hemisphere. I certainly do. I have long maintained that we should have it, that the countries of Latin America stand in a little different relationship to us uh, than does, for example, the Hemisphere of Africa or Asia and so on. I regret to say we haven't gotten very far with the idea, however. Well, Senator, I see that our time is running out. I want to indeed thank you very much for taking the time out from the busy schedule. I know that uh, this afternoon at 6.30, right here on Channel 7, uh, you will be on Meet the Press. You will be having more questions popped your way then by some newspaper people. Four, I believe, on the panel altogether. And uh, so I indeed want to take uh, this opportunity to uh, thank you on behalf of the entire WCKT news staff for coming in and being with us today. Wayne, thank you, and may I very quickly say, I think this has been a wonderful program. Of course, I had no idea what you were saying or what questions you were going to ask me. I've just sat here as an observer, but I think that uh, everything you've said, uh, I agree with. I think it's wonderful, and I think these are the type of programs that give us all a much better idea of our neighbors to the south and what we ought to do about it. And may I just take this moment to say I thank WCKT for sending Dick Lobo on this trip with us. These pictures have been helpful. He speaks Spanish, which was also helpful to us. Thank you, Wayne, for this wonderful job which you're doing. Thank you, Senator. Senator Smathers, one of the best informed men in Congress on hemispheric relations, assures the Latin nations that our interest in them is sincere. Tomorrow, President Eisenhower will carry his personal diplomacy to Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. Special NBC reports will be routed through WCKT news facilities. South America is a hungry continent of 183 million people, 60% of whom are dependent upon agriculture. Less than 8% own producing land. 12 of the 20 Latin republics showed trade deficits in 1959. This unstabilized economy combined with a vast illiterate populace paves the way for red infiltration. Their overt aggressions are launched as revolutions against hunger, poverty, and disease. The answer, some believe, is in price stabilization and mineral quotas. Some favor economic subsidies. Others prefer a free market. The United States in 1959 contributed more than $151 million toward improvement of Latin living standards. But we have a lot of ground to make up in the field of foreign diplomacy. We were shocked by the 1958 assaults on Vice President Nixon, stung by anti-U.S. riots in the Canal Zone, and stunned by Cuba's bold defiance in 1959. We can no longer accept political unrest and sporadic violence as a part of the Latin American way of life, nor can we tolerate these outbursts as nothing more than local desperation as opposed to an affront to U.S. prestige. Sometimes it's difficult to draw the line between the spirit of nationalism and creeping communism. Therefore, it's imperative that our diplomats acquire a better knowledge of the problems and conditions of our neighbors to Compass Point South. U.S. failure as a leader in the Western Hemisphere will reflect on our ability to lead the free world. We can settle for nothing less. This is Wayne Farris, WCKT News. Special guest, Senator George Smathers, will be interviewed tonight at 6 p.m. on NBC's Meet the Press, originating in the WCKT studios.